Well, it is good to be with you all this afternoon. I trust you're enjoying the time here, very rich time, together with like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ as we examine such a wonderful, wonderful topic, understanding the missionary's work. As Chris said, my name is Brad Clausen, and I had the privilege for 12 years of being engaged in the work of pastoral training in the former Soviet Union. Uh, They were 12 very, very blessed years of my life, would never change them for anything else. So thankful for the Lord for all that he did in my life and all the lessons that I was able to learn through that. I wasn't the only one learning, or the students weren't the only ones learning in that context. I learned a lot through that. And what I hope to do uh, this afternoon and during the, the time that we have together is look at a particular aspect of this task of pastoral training. And as the title suggests, look at how the local church here in the United States, in a very developed, very affluent, very resource wealthy context, can understand its responsibility and its obligations to the work of pastoral training. Now, there's a lot of, of dimensions to look at, a lot of different uh, issues to cover, and I can't obviously touch on all of those in uh, the 45 minutes that I have. So, like I said, I'm going to really focus on how the local church needs to understand its task in the selection, uh, the support, and the sustenance of the pastor trainer, the missionary who's engaged in pastoral training work uh, once he gets to the field. Now, just a few words before I get into that. Uh, When we talk about the work of pastoral training and its relationship to the Great Commission, there, of course, is the need for understanding balance when it comes to uh, the Great Commission, especially over the last century and and even more so the last half century when the focus has been on the unreached people groups, the Great Commission has morphed, or our understanding of the Great Commission has morphed really to really seeing it primarily as as an evangelistic effort. And the common proof text for that would be a text like uh, that of the Apostle Paul in Romans 15 verses 19 to 20 where he talks about his aspiration to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named. And so that becomes a whole missionary motto that the whole Great Commission is is focused on going to to the unreached people groups and that anything that that focuses or that that, uh, relates to the work where existing churches uh, are already operating, that's kind of post-missions work. Well, that kind of an approach doesn't take into account Paul's entire philosophy of missions. And And we need to balance Romans 15 and what Paul mentioned there with his very explicit purpose that he states in a text like Colossians 1 verse 28 to 29 where he also talks about his missionary endeavor. And he's very clear and he he talks about his his proclamation of Christ, what that involves in preaching Christ. And he defines it this way, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. This is part of the Great Commission, not just spreading the gospel as important as that is, not just even planting churches, seeing churches uh, start to, to become organized, but presenting every man complete in Christ. And Paul went on to say, for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. So when we think of the Great Commission and we think of its relationship to pastoral training, uh, let's look at it not as an either or but a both and. We see this in Jesus' own words in in Matthew 28 in his Great Commission uh, where he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And and here's the first component, the, the baptism, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the evangelism and and church planting component. But he also continues And he says, teaching them to observe all that I command. And so what we will look at this afternoon as it relates to the missionary's task is really the uh, the other side of the coin, uh, the the component of teaching, which includes church strengthening and, as we will talk about this afternoon, pastoral training. And, of course, Paul's letters are filled with this emphasis on pastoral training and its importance we could look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul gives us this paradigm for understanding how the gospel is passed down. It is uh, entrusted from the apostolic delegates of Jesus Christ, those 
chosen to be the foundation of the church, passed on to, to their disciples who then must look for other faithful men and entrust the same responsibility and task uh, to them also. And Paul states this so well in 2 Timothy 2, too. At the end of his ministry, he says these things, Timothy, which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. But we see that even at the very beginning of Paul's missionary endeavors on his first missionary trip, you see that after he preaches in the region of Galatia, he gets to the city of Derby, he stops, and then he retraces his steps. And we see that as he retraces his steps, he, he strengthened the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And then when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So this was really the second side of the coin, not post-missions, but part of the missions endeavor. Get it to the point where there are elders who are able to teach in those congregations. So today, as we consider the local church's responsibility uh, in response to the commission that Christ has given, how are we to understand the church's role with respect to pastoral training? Uh, how do we look at the, the duty, the obligation of the church with respect uh, to this important element of Great Commission work. And what I want to do this afternoon is give you three imperatives, three imperatives related to the sending and supporting of pastor trainers. Now, I, as, I, as I mentioned, there's so many things to look at. I could spend all afternoon just talking about a philosophy of pastoral training. Uh, we don't have time for that. Uh, but what I want to look at is the, the imperatives that the church has with respect to the sending and supporting of pastor trainers. And, and it's really quite simple uh, to some extent that, you know, this is nothing new for you, I'm sure. But because it is so important, we always must come back to these basics. And the missionary endeavor uh, is built on these basics. It's not rocket science, really. And it's built on our faithfulness to these very, very simple, straightforward principles. And these are the three imperatives that I want to leave you with this afternoon. Number one, it's very important for the church to understand that it must select, it must approve its pastor trainers like it would any other pastor. It's so important that you view the pastor trainer, the man who will be engaged in this work, as a pastor. He must have the same qualifications. There's not this is not a separate category of people who are somehow uh, unrelated to the elders and pastors in the church. Number two, uh, you must prepare them as a pastor. You must prepare these men who are going to be engaged in this work as an extension of your church. You must prepare them as pastors. And then number three, once they get to the field and are engaged in the work, your relationship to them must be the as the relationship to a pastor. So we'll go through these in greater detail this afternoon. Number one, let's look at the first one. Select them. Select a pastor trainer like a pastor. And this is so very important because uh, of some of the things we're going to talk about, but this is so very important because when this principle is missed, the, the train quickly gets off the tracks. And the end result of what this, this pastor trainer uh, is going to accomplish will begin to look very different from a church if at the very beginning he is not selected, he's not chosen, he's not approved as one would approve a pastor. Let me talk about a, a, a common error here with respect to this responsibility. And the error is this, that as I've observed and as I've read and studied this topic, that it's very common for local churches, as they decide who to send, who to approve for support, these kinds of questions, it's very common for churches to use lower standards for testing and approving candidates for missionary service, even for the responsibility of pastoral, pastoral training, than they would use for the testing and approving of candidates to serve as pastors in their own local churches. There's this idea that, well, they're going to serve outside of our 
uh, of our walls. They're going to serve in some other undeveloped country, underdeveloped uh, ecclesiastical context. And so we can use lower standards for these men as we, we choose them and prepare them uh, to go. Now, what, what does this error arise from? I think you can point to four primary causes for this kind of thinking, of, of using lower standards. First of all, there's, uh, there's an ignorance. There's an ignorance with respect to the nature of the difficulty, the nature of the task that the pastor trainer faces on the field. Uh, th- there's the idea that we have it so bad here in North America. You know, the media is against us. The liberal politics are against us. We, we have such a hard environment here. So anywhere else around the world is just going to be easy. And in rea- reality, that's very, very untrue. In fact, this is an easy place to minister, although there, you know, there are problems here too. It is much easier to minister as a pastor here in North America with all the protections that still are here and, and all the resources that are here and all the like-minded pastors that are here at a place like Shepherd's Conference and a conference like this that simply do not exist in the areas which need pastoral development. So sometimes this is just ignorance, the idea that we need the, the best and the brightest because we have the, we have the hardest context here uh, in North America, and that's not true. You need to, to recognize that the, the demands that those men will face are, are exceedingly difficult. Number two, there's kind of an arrogance that also gives rise to this idea that, that we deserve the best and the brightest. We can handle uh, good, deep, theological, exegetical preaching. But in those underdeveloped contexts, they just need Sunday school teachers. Uh, they just need those who are basically capable of expressing the gospel, and that will be good enough for them. But we need the, the profound thinkers here. That's a kind of arrogance, a condescension uh, that keeps churches from sending the men that they should be sending uh, to the field. There's an apathy also that exists. Uh, we're concerned about the quality of spiritual care in our own churches, and we simply lack a, a concern for the spiritual care that's taking place in other countries around the world. And in some cases, the reason for the lower standards can simply be ambition. You know, we have an invitation. We want to, to uh, place another photo on our missionary map uh, we we want to fill it up as quickly as possible. We want to plant our flags somewhere. And so that ambition will drive us to just send whoever's willing to go so we can say we have somebody over there. And all of those things contribute to some very significant problems on the field uh, as it relates to pastoral training. And, and in particular, the end result that we find is that it results in the, the what, what you could call the amateurization of the pastoral office in that foreign context. That because we've had such a low view of the, the kind of men that are required to train those pastors, that inevitably results in just a very low and an anemic understanding of pastoral ministry in those missionary contexts. I'm reminded of a warning that Martin Lloyd-Jones gave at the inauguration of London Theological Seminary back in 1977, and this relates to churches, uh, local churches, in a very developed context. And these words apply just as much to pastor trainers. He said this, the churches and ministers, let us admit, have been far too ready to lay hands suddenly on any man. If any young man says vaguely that he would like to go into the ministry, we immediately encourage him to do so. We may be quite wrong in doing so. This is a very serious matter. I assume that we are all agreed that the minister is not a professional man, in the sense of a, it's a profession or a career. No man should go into the ministry as a profession. What then do we desire? Well, he must be a converted man. He must be a man who is aware of the new life in himself, but he must be a spiritually minded man also. This is essential. I have always maintained that if a man can stay out of the ministry, he should do so. Every minister and preacher should be able to say, the love of Christ constraineth me. Now this warning, uh, I would say quite confidently, is, is very well applied in our local churches here. 
but it's not so consistently applied as it relates to sending missionaries over to train the next generation of leaders for other churches. We need to raise the bar. We need to raise uh, the standards and, and realize that the church must select and support candidates, whether it's from within your own congregation or in partnership with other churches or, or whether it's through your support, it, you must support candidates to be pastor trainers according to the same spiritual criteria that are used to select and support a pastor in, in your own contexts. That the qualifications that Paul has so clearly given to us for spiritual eldership in the church apply just as much to the pastoral trainer. And, and remember that he is going to be reproducing himself in the lives of, of the, the national leadership. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5, these are all texts that, that should be the, 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 the distinguishing mark, the, the, the watermark, you could say, for any man that we want to support and send as a pastor trainer. These men must be rigorously evaluated in terms of their aspirations and their motivations. Why are they going? In terms of their character, the, their piety, their prayer lives, their, their convictions, their theological beliefs, their, their capabilities, and of course the issue of affirmation, the affirmation of other Christians as to their giftedness and, and character. In essence, they must be ordainable men, men who are ordained even far before they get to the field and begin the work of training other pastors. Now it comes down to this very important principle that Jesus gave us in Luke chapter 6. He said, a blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into the pit? The pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. So whomever we send, that's the, that's the cookie cutter, really, for all the subsequent pastors that will come out of that pastor trainer's ministry. The pastors, your missionary, the one that you send, the pastors your missionary will produce will inevitably reflect the kind of man that he is. And that realization uh, must cause us to seriously ponder the kind of men we are going to select and to send to engage in this work. Secondly, Prepare a pastor trainer like a pastor. Now, it's not just the selection of them according to the spiritual qualifications, but this point deals with their preparation for the work uh, on the field. What are they going to be engaged in? And here I want to look at two extremes. First, the first error here is the, the prioritizing of speed in sending a pastor trainer to the field over the necessity of thorough preparation. Now, the causes for this, again, are manifold. Uh, in, in, in some circles, it's the excessive emphasis on urgency. It was John Mott, who about a century ago in the student volunteer movement, who said, you know, the, the evangelization of the world in this generation, and that changed the focus to a, a very pragmatic approach where now it was just get, get them to the field, do whatever it takes, just get them to the field. And we must be motivated by that urgency, but that that sense of urgency must not be lost in the, the recognition of the importance of, of preparation for the work that is to be done. We, we have to guard against a kind of pragmatism that, that just says, let's do whatever it takes to get him to the field as quickly as possible and then turn him loose on the work. There's also the idea, a, a wrong one, that sometimes influences this, that the, the pastor is, is more like an administrator He's more like a practitioner, but he's not a theologian. He doesn't have to be a deep thinker. All he has to do is just, just pass on things that he himself has received somewhere else, and, and he's done his job. And that's not the portrait of a pastor. But when this kind of thinking is followed, the, the result I is this. We, we export ministerial pragmatism. That in the same way that, that we've taken shortcuts here in the preparation of that man for the work, that man takes shortcuts in his own context and shortchanges the national pastors there and they enter their ministry as pragmatists as well. 
Not only that, but the reason why pastor trainers are needed in those contexts is because there's a theological anemia in the first place. But if you have not trained your pastor trainer to be a, a deep thinker in the scriptures, he will himself exhibit theological, uh, a theological anemia and he will perpetuate that on the field. He will not bring what's needed for that underdeveloped context. And then, of course, this will empower a kind of religious syncretism when, when the pastor is not able to pass on a, a very careful, thorough, exegetical, theological understanding of Scripture. Those national pastors will be unable to resist the influences of their, their own context. And as a result, syncretism quickly creeps back into the church. And that's what we see in so many countries around the world where, where the church though it's been there for decades already, is just filled with, with this, this, this anemia and the syncretism, all because the, the men who trained those leaders were not themselves strong in the scriptures. David Sills says this with respect to this, this push, this constant push for, for speed. He says, as missionaries have joined the race to reach the unreached people groups of the world as quickly as possible, they have strategized to increase speed. The need for speed has influenced missionary efforts so much that many traditional missions tasks have been jettisoned in order to enable it. And, and pastoral training is one of those. The proper theological, doctrinal preparation of pastor teachers. There's an opposite error to this. And if on the one side, you have the error of under-preparation and speeding up the process as quickly as possible. The other error, which can also be prevalent, is an overemphasis on academic degrees at the expense of pastoral experience. We, we have a very high view of the, the ability of the academy to solve uh, the problems or to meet the needs in these underdeveloped contexts. The causes for this kind of thinking can come from a, an excessive reaction to pragmatism. They, they didn't prepare the guy at all, and they sent him to train leaders. Well, we're going to train him for 10 years and then send him when he knows Greek and Hebrew, but not just Greek and Hebrew, which are important, but Latin and German and all these other academic languages. This comes also from a naive optimism about the potential of the academy, that, that our, our Western style of education is the solution to all the world's problems. And uh, we, we have to, 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 tr to create a scholar who's, who's able to, 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 to mingle in those circles, and that's what will be the solution to the problems on the field. In some cases, there's this remnant of an undue concern for academic respectability. We want to only send those men who have published in ETS and in journals and have written academic books and so on and so forth. Those are the men who can go and, uh, and successfully train other pastors. Well, the result of this kind of extreme thinking is that the missionary can easily get caught up in the trappings of the academy. Uh, he can begin to equate pastoral training with, with the, the conferral of degrees, that, that now the success of, of training leaders is, uh, is in direct uh, relationship to the number of degrees he offers and diplomas that he issues. That's not at all what Paul had in mind in 2 Timothy verse 2. And in the end, you can have missionaries who produce professors, who, who plant seminaries, but who do not do the work of producing pastors. In fact, it's important to note that when it comes to the spread of theological liberalism around the world, it's always been spread through the academy. This is, this is how it happens. And, and if you look at those countries today which are asking TMAI, for example, to come and, and to train pastors, it's not that pastoral or, or theological education has never existed in those countries. Some, in some cases, theological education has existed in those countries for decades. But those places are rife with higher critical thinking and, and skepticism, and they deny the inerrancy and authority of Scripture and they're, 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 in, they're infiltrated with all kinds of, of uh, philosoph philosophical thinking and so on. Now, what's the problem there? In, in some of those cases, in fact, in a large number of those cases, missionaries were sent there, but 
not as pastors and, and not as churchmen, but they were sent as, as intellectuals and as professors specifically to establish schools, not to strengthen churches and train pastors. The church must prepare the missionary who is going to engage in the work of pastoral training as it would want to prepare the man who would train its next pastor. Think of it that way. As you're in local churches and you're thinking about the next pastor who will, who will come in the next generation to minister to your children, think of that and think of, of how that future pastor, that hypothetical pastor, needs to be trained. What kind of man do you want that, that young pastor, that pastor candidate to be trained for your children? And, 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 and think back from that. And that's what we need to do with respect to the work on the field. The key question is, what kind of pastors are needed in those contexts around the world? What kind of pastors do we need there? Let's define it biblically. Then let's step back and ask another question. How will the missionary that we want to send, how will he train those, kind, those kinds of pastors? And then come back even one more step and say, how must the missionary then be prepared for that kind of training? We have to allow the, the end result to affect everything all the way back to the very beginning in the preparation of that man for ministry. So as you may have candidates for this kind of work in your churches, you can't start to think of this once he gets to the field. You need to be thinking of it already. How do we get him the best kind of, of training that he needs for this task? Indeed, the need on the field, the need for national pastors to be doing the work according to 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and 2 Timothy 4 and 1 Peter 5, the, the, the nationals that are, are needed there deserve our best men trained in the very best ways to develop their mind, to strengthen their character, and to provide the pastoral experience they need uh, for doing the work and training others in it. And the key is this, our understanding of the end product of what we are called to produce on the field must determine the way that we prepare those who are to produce it. And that's the responsibility ultimately of the local church. And you can't delegate this to other organizations. You can't even delegate this to seminaries. This is the responsibility of the local church in ensuring that the men that it is going to send to do the work of pastoral training have received the very best theological and pastoral training uh, that they can. And then thirdly, we must treat the pastor trainer like a pastor. And this, of course, involves both the, the, the kind of vigorous accountability that a pastor needs as well as honorable support. This is, this is important. We must recognize that the, the pastoral office is a very special a, a very special calling and has very serious spiritual responsibilities and we understand that here with respect to our own pastors there must be the vigorous accountability of a, a plurality of elders and and a healthy church uh, that that expects the best and the most from their men and pastoral leadership and at the same time as the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13 that there must be the honor that's given to uh, those who are engaged in this work. Let me deal with a few more errors here. Number one, another, one error here is simply the, the entrusting of the pastor trainer once he gets to the field, the, the entrusting of his work and his oversight to a parachurch organization. Churches may lack the interest in it. They, they say, well, we've prepared him, we've produced him, we're handing him off, this is the baton, now he moves on to some other oversight, and that's obviously uh, an incorrect ecclesiology. A second problem is that churches sense that they're unable to do this. They're unable to shepherd the, the pastor trainer on the field, and so they'll just entrust that, that they'll delegate that work to a, a parachurch organization. Or sometimes it's an ignorance of the need. Uh, th there's the idea that, well, 
really the, the shepherding role is, is just an administrative one. It's all about making sure support gets there. It's accounting and these kinds of things. When uh, that's really the small part of it, the biggest part of the pastor trainer's needs on the field is that, that fellowship and ongoing spiritual accountability. The result then of this kind of thinking is that, that the centrality of the local church is de-emphasized. It, the work of pastoral training no longer is the work of a, a local church or a group of churches. Now it becomes a, uh, the work of a parachurch organization, and there's many that are engaged in this. And this is one of the reasons why TMI is just never going to be a, a, any kind of missionary sending uh, instrument. It's not what TMI is all about that needs to be done by the local church and the local church needs to needs to uh, shepherd those those missionaries he, uh, Paul said very clearly in first Timothy 3 that it's the church that is the the pillar and support of the truth and this extends explicitly to the the transfer of the truth to the next generation of of national pastors this is the church's responsibility number two in some cases the church simply loses interest in the pastor trainer as soon as he is in the in the field and in the work and and that that honeymoon stage quickly passes and the church just moves on to other things the causes of this as well are manifold sometimes it's just a very pragmatic kind of uh, out of sight out of mind we don't see him around here anymore and, and so we begin to lose touch with him and interest we lose interest in his ministry Sometimes it's uh, an incorrect set of priorities that that, that uh, mi- ministry that that trainer is doing on the other side of the world is kind of a little footnote or parentheses in a budget somewhere, uh, or it's somewhere there, you know, beside the VBS program, once a year kind of interest kind of a thing that, that churches, the churches have, and it's not part of the, the, the thinking, the everyday thinking, the every week thinking of the church, and so it's pushed to the side. And sometimes it comes from an ignorance of the need of encouragement and accountability. Well, our, our elders here are doing just fine. So we assume that the, the pastor trainer in his field is doing just fine as well, when in reality he's got a whole lot more, uh, more problems to deal with than your own elders. And that need for the plurality feeling, the fellowship among elders is so important for him. The result of this kind of thinking is isolation. The uh, missionary becomes isolated on the field. And begins to feel it, and it's a dangerous thing. Discouragement. He he begins to uh, feel that no one else is interested in what he's doing, and so many missionaries end up quitting because of this. They they lose uh, their ability to endure because of the fact that no one's there helping them along. Doctrinal drift. Missionaries in those contexts can be confronted with so many opposing ideas. And without m- other men alongside them, even from afar, who will challenge their thinking and sharpen their thinking, they can drift into doctrinal aberrations. And again, th- they can drift into moral failure. No accountability. No one asking them about their prayer lives, about how their families are doing, about their relationship with their wife and children, about how they're handling money, these kinds of things. And moral failure can re- result. Paul Tripp, in his book, Dangerous Calling, talked about the danger of isolation for pastors here and as i read this think of how this is so exponentially greater the the danger of this with respect to the missionary on the field you only need to take seriously what the bible has to say about the presence and power of remaining sin to know the great danger in allowing anyone to live separate from the essential ministry of the body of christ let alone the person who is charged with leading guiding and protecting the body as the representative of christ If Christ is the head of the body, and he is, then everything else is just body. The most influential pastor or ministry leader, I would even say pastor, trainer, missionary, is a member of the body of Christ and therefore needs what other members of the body need. An intentional culture of pastoral separation and isolation is neither biblical nor spiritually healthy. Another error here is that of placing unrealistic expectations on the pastor trainer and his ministry. Here there's a, it can be a naivete about the challenges on the, the field and, and an assumption that things are easy. You can, quickly, you can quickly gather pastors and you can have lots of conferences because we do it easy here. 
that's not the case. There can be a propensity to elevate quantity over quality, and so there's this push all the time for numbers. We need more students in the program. Uh, We need more churches, more national churches impacted by that missionary's ministry. Number three, there can sometimes be an unrealistic expectation that the missionary has to establish the same kinds of, of educational formats that we see here. We're all familiar with this kind of seminary training. Well, if he's not reproducing the same look to it in that foreign context, he must not be doing his job. So we're going to wait for him to create that master seminary in that other context. And until he does, he hasn't reached any kind of success. The result is the missionary is going to be driven to pragmatism, to do whatever it works, to produce the numbers, to frustration as he tries to communicate that this isn't how it works. The church doesn't listen to discouragement, the inability to convince his elders that that, that isn't how the, the situation here uh, looks and, and it isn't what the situation needs and eventually the missionaries will depart their work. Well, how can you resist these things? Let me just give you a few points as we uh, come near to the close here. As you think of how to treat a pastor trainer and, and how to treat him like a pastor on the field, here are some suggestions, and there's so much more that we could talk about in, in, the, in the particularization of these things, but it's imperative for the church to show a true, genuine, ongoing interest in their lives. You know that for your own pastors, it's important for the church to love those pastors and to to minister to them as they minister to the congregation. The same thing is true for the pastor trainer. His church that has sent him or that supports him, the group of churches involved in his ministry, have to show him this ongoing, genuine interest in his life. There needs to be an accountability where where the elders of these churches don't... don't, uh, delegate this responsibility to others, but all take it upon themselves to ask the hard questions about the man's personal piety. This is essential. How is the man living his life on the field in, in, a, in a context removed where, where the standards are different there? Is he, is he maintaining that close walk with the Lord so that he is an example for the flock to follow and an example for the pastors to emulate? What about his doctrinal fidelity? Do you know the kind of textbooks that he's using in his training? The kind of courses that he's teaching? His, his statement of faith that he, he, he passes on to the students? The church is needed to keep those missionaries focused on, on the ministry purpose of training up national leaders and not getting sidetracked into the many different uh, detours that, that can be there. Churches need to be active in providing resources for ongoing effectiveness, uh, bringing those pastor trainers back for things like the shepherds' conferences and, and getting them extra training to keep them mentally sharp and, and bringing them back even to, to serve in the local church for a time of furlough so they're ministered to but are also sharpening their pastoral skills. Churches need to show esteem for the labors and sacrifices of these men who are working hard and and among the most sacrificial missionaries that are there as they pour their lives uh, into national pastors. And then churches must receive them with honor and with the encouragement that Scripture commends for all elders involved in the work of the ministry. The church must relate to the pastor trainer as it would relate to one of its own pastors. It must view him and his ministry as an extension of its own pastoral leadership. This is so fundamental to the success of the work of training national pastors. It has to be the extension of biblically sound churches, the extension of their ministry to create the same kinds of men and the same kinds of churches in those contexts. In other words... A biblical ecclesiology, how we understand what the church ought to be and how we understand the pastoral office and what it ought to be, that must influence the way that local churches relate to the pastor trainer and his ministry. So those are the the three imperatives uh, for this afternoon. 
Select a pastor trainer like you would select a pastor. Prepare a pastor trainer like you would prepare a pastor and treat a pastor trainer like you would treat a pastor. And I know there's so much more we could talk about. We do have a few moments for questions here. I do have to let you go no later than 3.20, and, and that was emphasized. So, Mark, yes. yes. Some of the more well-developed uh, pastor training centers certainly is a need for some specialization, de definitely. But I would say this, that uh, the specialization really should be a development from within the nationals rather than uh, so much of an, a, an emphasis on the, the, those who are going as missionaries to train as, as pastor teachers. Certainly, we need, uh, we, we need those who are in those national contexts, in the language, in the culture, going to become the writers of commentaries and literature uh, who are going to, 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 to be able to handle those specific areas of very uh, complex issues related to theology. But my, my recommendation on that would be to find the nationals who can do that specialization and really enable them to take the level of the training uh, deeper and, and further as the context develops. Uh, yes. Thank you for the uh, presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, my question is about and relates to pastoral training person. What about women? What about the training of women? Yeah, uh, that's that can be part of the the trainer's responsibility as he uh, trains lay people in the church, as he does train. Uh, the, the new believers, the older believers, just with respect to the fundamentals of the faith and the, 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 the ministry that needs to take place in terms of the one another's. That certainly is there as opportunities permit. But what's really important, uh, and we see this concept with, with Jesus, he took 12 men and he poured himself into those 12 men and their, their responsibility then was to take it to the church or, 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 or to, to be the foundation for the church. And the pastor trainer really needs to focus and, and keep that laser-like vision on the target of training pastors. Now, if additional opportunities present themselves to train all kinds of members in the church, that's great, that's wonderful. He may have time to do that. But really, he needs to focus on the, the, the national leadership and then enable them to occupy the role of the shepherds of their churches. That's really a responsibility for them. My question is, the church sending the pastor, or the church send the women to train, or that's part of the equation as well, the sending part? Uh, you, well, the sending part, we have to be driven by texts like 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, and where, where Paul very clearly says, uh, you know, I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Now, does that mean that a woman is not saved the same way? or it does not have a role in the local church ministry, absolutely not. But we recognize that God has placed a difference in the function of the sexes in the church for his own glory, as 1 Corinthians 11 says. And so what we're talking about here is the function of pastoral ministry. The men who are trained in those national contexts can certainly and must certainly be involved in the equipping of the entire church, which would include the equipping of women to do things like Titus chapter 2 says, to be trainers of women. Uh, but that's a, that's a responsibility for those local shepherds, those national pastors to be, to be involved in. Yes? Thank you. I kind of that. How can I interact with, like, say, a place where they are already kind of bought into um, kind of an academy in the sense of like, academic scholarship, you know, trying to think, like, where they, they will not have a demand. They have to have a PhD person where the theological liberalism already is on the forefront of the issues in our country. So they're wanting uh, is MAI interacting in that in that uh, arena, or are they focusing more on not going to mess with that kind of those kind of issues? Yeah, that's a good question. And, 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 and like accreditation, where the national school says, well, 
we got to be excited if we're going to be relevant. Yeah. Uh, you know, th there's nothing inherently wrong with accreditation, but if a ministry is is wrongly it wrongly understands accreditation as kind of the key to success for their ministry and is driven by this idea of of uh, uh, of, of academic respect in the world around, that that is a big problem. Uh, and it can become a huge obstacle to the, to the work of the ministry. Now, you know, it would depend on the situation, but TMAI uh, operates uh, according to a few very strict principles. And, and one of them is that it, the, the invitation has to come from churches to, to be involved in the work of pastoral training, not just a, 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 an existing seminary that wants to have some help. It has to be church based and it has to be under that umbrella. We recognize the centrality of the local church. Now, can there be situations where a training center that exists in cooperation with several local churches that there's some kind of a com combined invitation? Ab absolutely, but it's gonna depend on the situation. Uh, but yeah, when there's entrenched liberalism in those schools, uh, that, that's, that's a very uh, tricky thing to, to work with and um, yeah, th there's, in the reality, it, it's better to find, for the success of the work of the ministry, it is better to find a couple of good local churches that are serious about training up men for ministry and work with them. Uh, we don't need to get sidetracked in, in wanting to have, you know, names and titles and things of that nature uh, on some kind of a, an academic respectability list. No, what we're serious about is the Great Commission and teaching, all, uh, teaching men to, to, uh, and women and, and all in the church to obey everything that Jesus has commanded and entrusting to faithful men. At those kinds of schools, there, there may not be faithful men. They may have schools and existing infrastructure, but there may not be faithful men there committed to church. Any other questions? I think I need to let you go. Thank you for your interest. Have a great rest of the afternoon.